In July 2013, the British Home Office launched a communications pilot campaign in which a van carrying a large billboard drove around six boroughs of London with sizable migrant populations. This is what this van looked like. The billboard displayed a photo of handcuffs, the logo of the Home Office and the following text. In the UK illegally, 106 arrests last week in your area. Go home or face arrest. Text HOME to 78070 for free advice and help with travel documents. We can help you to return home voluntarily without fear or arrest or detention. From the point of view of the British government and the Home Office, this campaign uh, the Go Home Van campaign, as it became known, uh, was used as a policy tool. It was an instrument to ensure that the immigration rules were uh, complied with and that the so-called immigration offenders were removed from the country. However, uh, this campaign also led to some unwanted negative consequences. What do you think? Uh, what happened next? What was problematic about this campaign and about this billboard? So here is my first small task to you, just uh, as a warm-up. Please take a minute to think about this and uh, write down your thoughts. What do you think may have been problematic about this campaign and about this billboard? What were its negative consequences? So the time is up. I'm sure you came up with some interesting ideas. And we will return to this case of the go home van later in this lecture. But let me first briefly introduce myself so you would better understand why I would like to talk to you about government communication today. So uh, my name is uh, Sten. Uh, I studied uh, journalism and uh, communication here in Tartu. Then I worked uh, as a communication advisor at the Estonian government office for 10 years and engaged in all sorts of gov government communication activities, ranging from, from planning, strategic planning, to, to everyday uh, uh, activities like, like writing press releases and, and, and answering uh, journalists' questions. Uh, then I decided to return to academia and, and I, I defended a doctoral thesis on British government communication at Lancaster University in, in, in the United Kingdom. And currently uh, I am a senior researcher at the University of Tartu and, and, and I am specializing in, in government communication research. So this is why I'm interested in government communication and this is why I would like to, to start or, or proceed with a Important question, what is government communication? So we are exposed to uh, and affected by government communication every day. It is, it is ubiquitous. In modern democracies, governments produce vast amounts of text, talk and images that are made available to the public. So there are news releases, social media postings, policy documents, televised speeches, broadcast interviews, advertisements, and so on and so forth. The actions of government office holders, 
and also their public communication potentially affects the lives of thousands or millions of people. So therefore it's uh, unsurprising that a large proportion of the daily news served by the mainstream media is about governments or is somehow related to the members uh, and activities of governments. So the topics uh, range from, say, road safety and education and international diplomacy to social inequality and migration and defense budget and perhaps also an occasional resignation of a cabinet minister. So a number of terms are used to refer to public communication activities carried out by governments. So terms like, well, government communication, administrative communication, government information, government public relations, government publicity, also government media management. What is important to understand is, is government communication is, is part of, of pol political communication. It belongs to the arena of political action. The word political is complicated. It has several meanings and dimensions but in broad terms, it integrates two contradictory senses. And here I refer to a linguist and political discourse analyst, Paul Chilton, who wrote, On the one hand, politics is viewed as a struggle for power between those who seek to assert and maintain their power and those who seek to resist it. On the other hand, politics is viewed as cooperation, as the practices and institutions that a society has for resolving clashes of interest over money, influence, liberty and the like. So it is a really important point when people use the term politics, what do they mean? And I think this here definition by Paul Chilton is, is a great one. So it points out that there are two sides to politics. It's about struggle for power and also the practices of cooperation, practices and institution that Sosurista has for resolving clashes of interest. And ideally, a government is an institution that is supposed to resolve clashes of interest in, in society. So it means that, that ideally government communication should, in a way, contribute to resolving clashes of interest over money, influence, liberty, and so on and so on. Now, there are three important points that I would like to make about the nature of government communication. So what is it that makes government com communication special? How is it different from communication by, say, uh, parliaments or, or private companies or, or a university, for that matter? So there are three main points then. First of all, most importantly, communication of the executive government can be backed up by legal and physical sanctions. So a government can issue commands and use its coercive resources. So it means the police, the courts, the prisons to punish those who do not comply. So in the case of the British government go home van campaign that we just looked at, the language used by the government the department on their campaign billboard was explicitly backed up by coercion. So it said uh, there was an order, go home, which was followed by a promise to punish those who would not obey. So it said go home or face arrest. So governments and government uh, office holders are therefore perceived as powerful high status actors. Uh, their requests, uh, their choices of conversational topics and assumptions of shared knowledge and beliefs are frequently accepted by government outsiders, citizens, even without actual threat of coercion. Uh, coercive uh, power is also exercised by government office holders when they censor others' language use, when they limit the public dissemination of certain kinds of information and when they regulate the arenas of communication. So, for example, by 
introducing policies that affect the work of journalists or social media platforms. So this is really what, what makes government communication different. Another important point is that governments communicate to establish and maintain the right to be obeyed by citizens. So this means that the government are in the business of legitimizing their own actions. So it may involve arguing in favor of certain courses of action chosen by the government. And also it may involve engaging in positive self-presentation. So like boasting about achievements of the government and so on. On the other hand, governments also may use language to delegitimize various opponents or attack their opponents by presenting their opponents in a more negative light. Sometimes blaming them or insult insulting them or marginalizing them. And also presenting alternative courses of action proposed by opponents as, as undesirable. So perhaps from a, a ethical point of view, this is, this is, this is not appropriate, but but this is what governments sometimes do. And the third important point about government communication is that governments try to control the amount and the quality of information that they give out. So it means that they may re uh, misrepresent events uh, or actions or outcomes, and, and this misrepresentation uh, depiction in, a, in an inaccurate way perhaps can involve uh, manipulative moves like uh, lying and verbal evasion and the use of euphemisms with the goal of uh, blurring the audience's understanding of some aspect of reality. One more point I would like to add is this. Governments have become increasingly mediatized. So this means that governments are increasingly adopting communication techniques and selecting employees and uh, devising policies on the basis of how well they seem to fit into a society where media plays a central role. This means, on the one hand, that government office holders themselves produce a lot of text, talk and images for public consumption. So governments draw up policy documents, they deliver televised speeches, distribute news releases via email and, and social media. They respond to reporters' questions at press briefings and give broadcast interviews. Uh, they also create websites and databases, they launch advertising campaigns, they tweet, they post comments, photos, videos on social media, and so on and so forth. And it requires a, a special type of person and special skills to, to do that. And on the other hand, as already pointed out, government office holders may be tempted to monitor and control the flows of information, including restricting access to some knowledge or perhaps making attempts to distract certain audiences from paying attention to certain problems in the society, including the possible failures and misdeeds of, of the policymakers themselves and the pu public administrators themselves. Let's talk about who are government communicators and, and what do they do? So some communication activities are carried, carried out at least in part by the top executive politicians themselves. So top ex executive politicians meaning members of the government cabinet, the ministers. So in Estonia, for example, the government's weekly press briefing at the Stenbock House in, in Tallinn. However, the bulk uh, of, of daily planning, preparation and presentation of government's messages and interacting with the press and the public is the full-time job of teams of communication experts, special advisors, press officers and spokespersons who have been specially hired by the government departments for these tasks. Importantly, their action is both enabled and constrained 
by various uh, regulations and institutions that determine what they can or cannot do and say. Uh, for example, freedom of information laws may establish what kind of government-held data should be made public. And uh, civil service legislation may stipulate the civil servant communicators should always remain impartial and avoid taking sides in party political struggles. Uh, so, therefore, professional government communicators may try to cast themselves as neutral, so-called so neutral transmitters of official administrative information. Uh, the tasks of professional government communicators who, who work at, at uh, government departments, not only in ministers, ministries, but also, say, like in in uh, police or other, other government institutions. Their tasks include uh, publicizing text about public, uh, policies and about uh, public services and about institutional arrangement of the, the government and, and also giving advice and orders to people, for example, on how to submit uh, an, an annual tax return or how to behave in a, in a case of a crisis like a flood or a pandemic. So, the government communication as a subdomain of political uh, communication usually does not cover distributing information about and on, on behalf of political parties. That includes election campaigns and political advertising. So, so ideally, ministries and civil servants working at, at government offices should not participate in, in, in uh, uh, party political campaigns. Uh, also, government communicators are not supposed to, to well, it's, the, the do domain of, uh, of government communication does not cover activities of, of uh, legislators like, like parliaments and congresses. So when, when you receive a message from, from the parliament, then, then it's at least uh, uh, it sh shouldn't be seen as, as, as the uh, belonging to the domain of, of executive government communication. And also the communication uh, of the heads of state who are not heads of executive government and who serve mainly as uh, mainly ceremonial roles like presidents in parliamentary democracies, like in Estonia, they, they, their communication probably does not also does not belong to to the domain of government communication. It should be seen seen as a separate subfield of of public communication. As a researcher, it is, it is notable, it is, it is interesting to me that that in comparison to to party political communication and election campaigns where the uh, struggle for power is perhaps more, more central and explicit. Uh, government communication has, has not received uh, that much uh, scholarly attention. It hasn't been researched much. Uh, there is one important exception, and this is presidential rhetoric in the United States. So there you can find many, many books and, and, and uh, research articles about the, the presidential rhetoric in the United States. So the president of the U.S. being the, the head also of the executive branch of government uh, there. Let's talk more specifically about the purposes of, of government communication. And I would argue that, that government office holders use communication for for two purposes mainly first of all they use communication to hold on to power to claim and maintain their right to be obeyed and to legitimize their policies and actions so Broadly speaking, the, uh, governing in a, in a democratic country means that those who govern must explain and justify their plans and, and their actions. So there are everyday accountability situations for that, such as journalistic interviews with ministers and top officials. There is uh, questioning during press conferences and, and with the prime ministers uh, 
uh, questions in parliament, for example. So this is where they have to explain their, their actions. Regarding uh, ministers, there are, of course, political opponents who make attempts to overthrow the incumbent by representing the policymakers publicly in a negative light, blaming them uh, for behaving in some norm-violating ways and, and causing bad uh, outcomes. So some use the term character assassination, so strategic character assassination of individual office holders or ministers may help fuel mediated scandals that undermine the overall trust in government. Thinking about what journalists do, journalists are oftentimes interested in seeking out and running, so to say, scandalous stories and are often eager, eager to publicize uh, blistering criticism of political elites and powerful office holders. It is really interesting to me that while those in power, the, the ministers, the, the government office holders, they usually try to avoid getting in the middle of a scandal. However, some politicians may sometimes deliberately use controversial rhetoric, like making perhaps a racist comment, to provoke and sustain scandals around themselves, just in order to dominate the media agenda. So obviously uh, the US President Trump is a, is a case in point here, who is constantly coming up with new scandalous statements that uh, and, and then sort of dictates the media agenda therefore. But I think it's it's more common that executive politicians uh, respond to public blame attacks by providing an apology or or then using some defensive rhetorical strategies, such as denying a wrong, wrongdoing or then counterattacking the blame maker or trying to distract the critical audience to, from paying attention uh, to. Uh, to blame. So all this is done just to hold on to power, so to claim and maintain the right to be obeyed, to legitimize their policies and actions. Incidentally, this is my special field of research and, and I'm really interested in this topic, so I have published research on this topic and if I may suggest some, some fur further reading to you, I have written a piece on on uh, on rhetorical strategies for blame avoidance in government. So I, I on the slide you can see the, the list of, of of the papers. So it's fairly easy for you just to Google those and 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 download the, the either the articles or the manuscripts which I have made available on, online. So there is also a paper about analyzing opposition government blame games, which focuses on the use of argumentation in political communication and in, in legitimizing le, uh, legitimizing government actions. Then there is a paper on the uh, discursive micropolitics of blame avoidance, which also talks about the ways how blame is made in public communication. And there is a chapter, a book chapter I, I, I published last year about uh, Brexit and blame avoidance. So it provides concrete examples of, of how the British government uh, has been talking about Brexit in, in such a way to uh, to uh, minimize uh, blame threat and hold on to power. So, as I said, there are two main purposes that executive governments use communication for. So, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, holding on to power. And secondly, obviously, it is about exercising power. So communication is used as a tool to influence people's behavior. So I think it's it uh, can be used as an instrument for either encouraging or discouraging certain behavior among diverse actors. And it may take various forms. So government office holders may issue uh, direct commands. They may uh, make requests that are backed up uh, by coercion, a threat of, of use of power. 
or some sometimes they use more subtle persuasive linguistic strategies that are designed to to bring about a behavior change but mask the underlying threat of punishment let's uh, briefly just look again at the example of the of the go home van so in this case language is used explicitly in a way that is backed up by coercion so an order is followed by a promise to punish those who do not obey so indeed it is an official task of the government office to ensure that the immigration rules are complied with and that immigration offenders are removed uh, from the UK accordingly uh, according to a report published by the Home Office after after this campaign uh, they wrote that they, this this campaign with um, uh, advance resulted in a total of 18 cases of voluntary departure and helped to save money because the campaign cost less than enforced removal go home or face arrest a threat used in government communication however Government office holders sometimes use communication to deceive people. And deception, of course, is, is not a new problem. And uh, let's have a look at a video about, about uh, why politicians lie. So this video is, is, has been produced by CNN, and uh, we will see a number of... of uh, scholars of political communication in the United States uh, talking about uh, the ways in which politicians may deceive people. Can an honest politician actually succeed? And my personal conclusion is no. Director Comey said that my answers were truthful and what I've said is consistent with what I have told the Americans. Where American. thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Deception involves two parts. The first is you're creating a false belief in somebody else, getting them to believe something that you know is not true. And the second is you have to intend to do that. Deception comes in many forms. Uh, the most common form is people just leaving stuff out. I don't want to tell you certain elements of what happened last night, but I tell you everything else. All human beings lie, and you would be hard put to find any human being that doesn't lie to some extent or another. Deception and trust in politics and in life in general are very old ideas. We can look at the Greeks. There was Diogenes. He had his lantern. He was looking for a single honest man. And the story goes that he died without finding one. But one of the really interesting linguistic patterns of deception is called the pronoun drop. This is where somebody says a statement that would normally have a pronoun, like the word I, disappear from the sentence. And the reason they do that is they're psychologically distancing themselves from a statement. One of the things we find is when it's about convincing a, a country to go to war, so big policy deception, that the president tends to use first person singular, I, less often. So they drop that pronoun when they're using the deceptive language. When Trump was asked about his contributions and conversations to the Attorney General of Florida, he says, I've just known Pam Bondi for years. I have a lot of respect for her. Never spoke to her about that at all. And it's classic because in each of the previous sentences the word I was there and in that last sentence, which is the target sentence about whether he actually spoke to her about the uh, case, he doesn't use the word I. An example from Hillary Clinton is when she was asked about the email controversy, her response was, well, it was allowed, rather than saying something like, I was allowed to do that. We have this tenet, strong tendency to accept what we hear. It's because the idea of deception just usually doesn't cross our minds. The silly example I use is the two cavemen, right, who are out in prehistoric times. And a third caveman yells, saber-toothed tiger. One immediately runs, right? 
The other looks around and goes, I wonder if that's true or not. So which one passes on their genes? Trust is the default. Even though we have a lot of concerns about deception and trustworthiness, day to day, conversation to conversation, we really do trust one another. But the catch is, unless you have a reason not to. So in political communication, it's interesting. Because it might be that politicians have a reason for deception. So it may make sense to a politician or, or a government office holder to, to sometimes to use communication to deceive people, but deception is problematic because it, it hurts democracy and it also may sometimes hurt people. So if politicians do not seek to give voters accurate factual information about their policies that they propose to implement, then voters cannot assess if their proposed programs will be in their interest or not. So ideally, government office holders should try to avoid being false or inaccurate in the sense of conveying information that may not be well founded. Uh, when politicians are not truthful uh, or when they're, they are creating a false uh, or ill-founded impression, uh, then those citizens uh, cannot really assess their, 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 the credibility of their, their policy proposals. And, and they are actually manipulating citizens, so they are in a way distorting the, the, the perspective on, on the world and the possible future. Uh, and and you, one cannot be a good citizen when uh, citizen when when politicians are lying to you or or misleading you. Uh, perhaps as a as a citizen uh, may make a kind kind of a misdirected choices uh, when when politicians lie. And misleading others can happen in a number of different ways, such as. Uh, well, discussive manipulation or, or misrepresentation. So it's not only about outright lying. An interesting term that is used in, well, in research of political communication is uh, bullshitting. So bullshitting involves an indifference to the truth of one's utterances. So bullshitters do not care about the sincerity and accuracy uh, of what they say. So they feel free to say whatever they consider will, will play well with their audience and just to advance their interests, whether or not uh, those uh, assertions are true or not. So uh, there was a classic text by, by a philosopher, Harry Frankfurt, that is titled On on bullshit from 1988 and Frankfurt wrote the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic are more excessive than his knowledge of the facts that are relevant to that topic this discrepancy is common in public life where people are frequently impelled, whether by their own propensities or by the demands of others, to speak extensively about matters of which they are to some degree ignorant. So, a case in point is the President of the United States, Donald Trump. So, let's look at a video, a piece of news from, from Sky News from uh, April this year, where Donald Trump suggests that injecting disinfectant may be used to cure coronavirus. The virus reacts to different temperatures, climates, and surfaces. The findings confirm that the virus survives better in colder and drier environments and does less well in warmer and more humid 
environments. And then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number on the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. Let's go live to our U.S. correspondent Cordelia Lynch in Washington. Uh, there have been more than raised eyebrows at these remarks from the president. Cordy? Yes, absolutely. I mean, all I can summarise the response really to this is incredulity, condemnation, consternation. No one could quite believe that these were the words coming out of the mouth of the president. Time and again, he has said, I am not a, a scientist, and then gone on to make these almost declarative remarks about possible cures, possible solutions to this virus, which he is so desperate to reach. But many of the scientists and the medical professionals uh, last night when they saw this said this is the very worst thing that you could do to your body, certainly in terms of disinfectant and ingesting it in any way. They have been at pains to say that that could cause severe damage to the lungs. It's dangerous, as you say. It is irresponsible. And in fact, we've also had a statement from the owner of the um, disinfectant, Dettol, at uh, Reckitt Benkisser. Let me just share that with you. In it, they say, as a global leader in health and hygiene products, we must be clear that under no circumstance should our disinfectant products be administered into the human body through ingestion, ingestion, or any other route. As with all products, our disinfectant and hygiene products should only be used as intended and in line with usage guidelines. It goes on to say, please read the label and safety information. We have a responsibility in providing consumers with access to accurate, up-to-date information as advised by leading public health experts. For this and other uh, myth-busting facts, that actually provides the website. Please visit covid uh, hyphen 19 facts.com. So you see a very lengthy statement from the company there. They're obviously deeply concerned by what the president had to say. And I think we saw, if not concern, then definite discomfort in the eyes of his scientist, Dr. Deborah Burks, a woman who has been by it. his side throughout these briefings. And you saw her sort of look to the floor and shuffle a little. It's very difficult to see uh, the man that they are working alongside go up uh, and address the nation in this way. What didn't come up uh, was the 50,000 death toll from coronavirus that America now faces. Donald Trump was also pushing back on hydroxychloroquine. This was a drug that he was touting as a possible miracle cure. Well, now a study has come out that suggests that, in fact, of the patients that they looked at, this resulted in more deaths, not less. This particular case uh, illustrates a situation where, where a bullshitter actually may, may uh, put people's uh, health and lives in danger. So following Trump's statements regarding injecting disinfectant some people actually tried this and 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 uh, suffered from uh, from really bad uh, consequences deception may also involve uh, an oversupply of irrelevant information to produce an information overload or sometimes it may also involve with holding parts of information needed uh, to make sense of what is being said. So I have written a paper about what I have called calculated overcommunication. Uh, and here I use a chance to quote my own work. Abundant supply of public information by government institutions is generally regarded as desirable and seen as an essential precondition of democratic rule. However, excessive provision of information to certain audiences may result in confu confusion or information overload, which in turn may hamper critical thought and derail critical discussions. So it means that, that even though it's, it seems 
desirable that that governments provide a lot of information sometimes it may be counterproductive because there is just too much information provided it's difficult to make sense of 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 its relevance and it also may may uh, be used to to uh, to shift attention away from from some problems in political life Now, a very important question. How to spot office holders deceptive communication? So, of course, there are many, many tips and pieces of advice regarding how to spot deception, but I would like to just perhaps mention three. So, first of all, it's really important to, to pay attention to your own emotions. Because deception often il involves uh, communicative strategies focused on potential vulnerabilities of recipients. So, their strong emotions or traumas, uh, their lack of relevant knowledge or, or, or their lower status. So, all, all, all of these emotional aspects may make the recipient less resistant r less resistant to accepting untruthful assertions if uh, what an office holder such as a minister says makes you very angry or if it makes you feel threatened or if it makes you feel extremely proud uh, then it is important to pay particular attention to the accuracy of what was said Secondly, it's important to look for instances of uh, fallacious and, and potentially misleading argumentation in politicians' text and talk. So they may perhaps use, uh, mm, uh, make claims that are not logically valid or that rely on some plausible, Im implausible suggestions. So it is really important to ask, do they actually present any evidence to support their claims. And thirdly, it is important to try to identify inconsistencies and contradictions in politicians' text and talk. So it's possible to, to show that sometimes their political speech contains contradictory claims. It's possible to point out differences between what the politician says or writes and what the other sources say on the same issue. And also it's possible to observe and talk to other people to document the differences between real social practices and the way in which politician, uh, politicians depict them in their text and talk. So again, three suggestions. Pay attention to your own emotions. Secondly, look for fallacious uh, argumentation or perhaps missing evidence. And thirdly, try to find evidence. Check the other, other sources and, and see what other, other people and other documents are, are saying about, about these, these topics. Now let's look at a an example of, of possible deception. So I'm going to show you a a small part of a speech by the British Prime Minister, former British Prime Minister Theresa May. Uh, she gave a speech on uh, Brexit negotiations last year in in March uh, 2019. Now, listen really carefully to what she says, and then let's analyze her her uh, her, her her statement and and see what you think might be problematic about what the prime minister may said here. 
Now, as Prime Minister, my job has been to negotiate the very best deal I could. I believe that's precisely what the government has done, working with the EU team led by Michel Barnier. Discussions have at times been difficult and robust, but we've both worked in a spirit of mutual respect and cooperation to get a good deal over the line. Now, I've made a lot of speeches about that deal over the last few months. Most of them have been in the House of Commons. On Tuesday, I'll be making another one when I open the debate ahead of the vote. But Brexit does not belong to MPs in Parliament. It belongs to the whole country. It belongs to the people who voted for it and want to see it implemented so we can all move on to a prosperous future. And that more prosperous future also belongs to those who voted against Brexit and who expect politicians to make reasonable compromises to, make our, to bring our country back together. Everyone now wants to get it done. So here is the text. Please take a minute or two to think about what, what may be problematic about what the Prime Minister may say here and did she perhaps try to deceive her audience? So the time is up, and in this example, indeed, the claim that everyone wants to get Brexit done is not truthful. In uh, linguistic terms, everyone here is a hyperbole, so it is a rhetorical device that uses extreme exaggeration to make a point. Uh, the use of, of hyperbole appeals to audiences' emotions and may be exploited, uh, for example, in election campaigns to mobilize voters. Uh, however, at the time, in, in March 2019, opinion polls in the United Kingdom had consistently shown that there was more than 40% of the population supported remaining in the European Union. So the use of extreme exaggeration to suggest that everyone wanted to, to get the Brexit done uh, could be regarded as an attempt to mislead the public by distorting that information. So it is clear that that uh, government government office holders uh, sometimes may may produce and distribute false or misleading information. They may try to deceive people. So what is to be done? So th there are many possible solutions. Some of ideas I've already mentioned. I think it's really important that that both journalists and critical citizens like you always try to verify information provided by government and government office holders. It's also important to think of who benefits. So when important claims are made, when claims make you perhaps angry or, or worried, think of who benefits. It's also important to try to correct inaccurate or misleading claims. So there are many, many fact-checking initiatives that journalists do, and these are great. 
and I encourage you all to, to also get involved in, in this kind of activities. It is also important that just not, not to spread un, unverified claims yourself. So just to be, be careful users of, of news and, and social media. Do not share if you have not verified some, some piece of news. And perhaps another last but not least an important suggestion would be do not vote for those who deceive or those who try to deceive. So as, as citizens we, we can elect people to, to, uh, to the parliament and also government thereby. And, and it's important to, to, to uh, keep track of, of how people in a government communicate and, and support those who do not deceive. Now, just to conclude the lecture, let's uh, now return to the case of the go home van that we looked at at the beginning. So I asked you to, to uh, think about what may have been some negative consequences of this kind of, of government communication campaign. As, uh, as I said already, from the point of view of the British government, this campaign was used as a policy tool to ensure that the immigration rules were complied with, immigration offenders, so-called immigration offenders, were removed from the country. However, many government outsiders saw this go-home campaign as in a, in a completely different light. Critics said that the use of such threatening ads should be seen as fear-mongering and thus as an attempt by the UK government to, to uh, curry favour with uh, certain kinds of voters who perhaps share xenophobic or anti-immigration anti sentiments. So it, it was part of, of party political campaigning from the point of view of, of critics. So from this perspective this campaign was essentially deceptive. It was presented by the Home Office as a tool for enforcing immigration rules, but it was actually used by its political leaders, the ministers, to gain advantage over their electoral competitors. Uh, the Go Home campaign was also widely criticized by human rights organizations and by religious groups, trade unions and politicians across the political spectrum for creating a climate of fear and intolerance. So they even made a campaign that attacked the government campaign. So they made similar vans that said stirring up tension and division in the UK illegally. Home office, think again. So, a campaign against a government communication campaign. The Home Office also received a legal complaint from the Refugee and Migrant Forum of East London that represented local residents who saw the rhetoric on the vans as breaching the government's duties on equality. And according to a report in the Guardian newspaper, the government agreed to consult with local communities before embarking on such campaigns again and accepted it would in future need to eliminate discrimination and harassment based on race, race and religion as well as to foster good relations between people from different racial and religious groups. So what this brief example demonstrates is that how government communicators may contribute to information disorder and hurt people. So it's important that you as journalists and communication professionals make sure that government communicators, government communication in your country will not turn into wicked party political manipulation or a threat to equality and tolerance that underline, that underlie democratic life. So we have come to the end of our lecture. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of topics, if you're interested in government communication research, 
then check out my profiles. So I have put my, my research work on, on Academia Edu, also on ResearchGate. And you can also follow me on Twitter, where I share my own research and also research concerning government communication and, and also political rhetoric. Thanks very much for listening and good luck.